All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think I know many of you, but uh, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Ben Crother. I'm the advocacy manager with America Walks and uh, general coordinator uh, for the Freeway Fighters Network. Um, there are a few new faces on here, which is great to see. Um, we're really fortunate today uh, to have Beth Osborne, who's the Director of Transportation uh, for America, join us today on, to give a bit of a primer on uh, how to put together a successful and community-driven um, reconnecting communities application. Um, I think a lot of you probably know Beth or know Beth's work as well, um, but Beth has been a, a leading force behind uh, getting uh, highways to boulevards and highway removal programs um, into federal legislation and has worked also with the U U.S. Department of Transportation prior to joining Transportation for America. So has a great insider knowledge uh, that she's going to share for uh, with us today. Um, I suspect we'll have uh, some time for questions at the end, um, but if you do have questions uh, in the meanwhile, um, feel free to use the chat. I'll copy some of those down and we'll, we'll save them uh, for the end unless Beth you want to do otherwise. Um, and folks, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat too, uh, who you are, where you're coming from, and what's uh, bringing you uh, to the Reconnecting Communities uh, program today. So Beth, I'm going to turn it over to you. That sounds great. And all I, people should definitely feel free to add questions in the chat. Um, if I catch them, I'll respond as I go. If not, at least you won't lose your thought. If you're anything like me, thoughts can flit in and out. And uh, uh, at least this can be a log of what was confusing as we went. Uh, so as Ben said, uh, I did used to work at the US Department of Transportation. Uh, I was there uh, for the first five rounds of what was then known as the Tiger Program, is now known as the RAISE Program. And um, we, uh, we learned a lot by just doing. So I'm going to start out by an immediate disclaimer, which is USDOT is going to learn a ton about what they're working with and what they're doing as they go. <laughs> go into this process, un oops, sorry, under the impression that they know what they're looking for and then they're gonna see things and they're gonna change their minds. So just keep in mind, this is their first time through and, uh, and this is gonna grow with them. Uh, I did just wanna let you all know who, who Transportation for America is. We're a national nonprofit focused on connecting people to jobs and essential services, uh, no matter how they travel no matter how much money they make and no matter their physical ability. We do our work through policy analysis and development through research and uh, uh, analysis of how the current transportation system is working or is the case not working often. And uh, uh, through direct technical assistance with those trying to do what we care about uh, uh, in, in their own communities. Um, these are the principles that we've laid out for federal legislation, you will notice principle number one, uh, or number three, connect people to jobs and services. Um, this is very much uh, looking at not just how highways can divide or poorly designed roadways, uh, but uh, very much in line with not just the Reconnecting Communities Program, but the new Neighborhood Access and Equity Program that is included in the um, uh, the new IRA bill or the Inflation Reduction Act bill. Um, we've pointed out for years that they create big divisions, even if they aren't, you know, buried highways or elevated highways, uh, that sometimes just a regular roadway can feel very much like a barrier due to the danger and the lack of accommodations for people moving within their community as opposed to trying to get through the community. Um, all right, I do want to write, remind folks of what is in the infrastructure law, because I think it's really important when thinking about how to tackle a, a project. So, uh, you know, of the overall bill, a little over 50% is surface transportation. Of the surface transportation program, particularly the highway program, there's little tiny piece that is competitive. 
Um, so you're not talking about a big chunk of the program available for competitive programs and reconnecting communities is only one of them. At the same time, there's a huge amount of money of this 87% that's going out by formula. And I don't want folks to lose sight of all of this money that is also, for the most part, available for reconnecting communities projects. In fact, in the notice of funding opportunity for the reconnecting communities program, USDOT points out that many of these programs, if not almost all of these programs, can be used as match for construction grants. Remember, in reconnecting communities, we have planning grants and construction grants and, or capital grants. And those capital or construction grants can be matched by federal funds up to 80%. I will also say some of the most exciting programs um, or projects that I know of that have been built are built by putting together lots of different programs. One of my favorite projects is Den Denver Union Station, which is a truly transformative project of, uh, that uh, changed an old rail yard into a way to connect communities over that rail yard and turn it into a transit center for the community. That project put, putting together, I can't remember if it was 11 or 12 different funding pots to make happen. So don't forget while we're looking at our little billion dollars for reconnecting communities or $3 billion, for neighborhood access and equity program as that comes out later in the year, maybe the new year, that there's over $400 billion sitting here that can also be used. It's just going through your state DOT and, and that should not be ignored. Um, okay, so let's start in the program. We're gonna go through just some of the basic requirements that are important to keep in mind and then we will get deeper in to some other things that we need to know as we are making our case to USDOT. So for this year, we're only talking about a, a small amount of money for the Reconnecting Communities Program because they have a billion dollars over five years. Um, and uh, they're making $50 million available for planning grants and $145 million for capital construction grants. Of the planning grants, they expect awards to be between 100,000 and 2 million. But if you just look at the number 50 million, you're gonna get the sense that if one project goes to each state or maybe some big states pick up a couple projects, that this is gonna be on the smaller side. I think uh, we're gonna tend to see uh, up to a million dollars, maybe less than a million dollars on average. The capital construction grants must be at least 5 million, but the range they cite in the notice can go up to 100 million. That's preposterous. That might be the maximum. They'll never reach the maximum. They're gonna wanna fund uh, uh, more than one project if that is made available. Um, so they, like I said, they point out there are other places to go to for funding reconnecting communities projects. One is they are going to create a reconnecting extra designation for those projects they fund that will, it, they hope, encourage folks to apply for other supplemental DOT discretionary funds like the RAISE grants and the multimodal project discretionary grant. They're, uh, they're going to give this reconnecting extra designation, which is going to boost you in the ratings for those other programs and they specifically call out formula funds as well. And then of course, we'll have to figure out what it is they do with, um, with the new neighborhood access and equity program. In future years, they might look to roll it in uh, to reconnecting communities since there's a lot of overlap or they may keep them separate. Uh, okay, so a handful of things to know about this funding. Um, there's no deadline to spend the money, but there is a deadline for what they call obligating the money. Uh, for capital grants, that generally means that the, the money is committed after you finish your engineering, your permitting, your environmental work. So that has to be done by a date certain, and then it takes a while to build, that's fine, but they do want to push projects forward. 
uh, planning grants can obligate much faster than that. You just really have to have a grant agreement in place. So after you get money awarded to you, you work out an official scope schedule and budget with USDOT. You all sign an agreement that that's what you're going to stick with. And that's when the money is, quote, obligated. It means Congress can't come behind and sweep that money up for any reason. Keep in mind, this is a reimbursement program. That means you will have to, with your partners, outlay funding and seek reimbursement for it based on complying with their eligibilities. This is not a grant like a philanthropic grant. So one of the reasons making sure you have match is important is your project can't move forward if you don't have uh, you know, some funding to get things going until you can seek reimbursement. You can apply for reimbursement regularly. Uh, some DOTs do it as much as once a day. Um, when I've handled uh, grants for partners, we've generally done it either monthly or quarterly. Um, but again, the money is outlaid by the project sponsor and reimbursed by the federal government. And that's where they discover if you use the money according to your grant agreement, whether or not you've spent it on eligible expenses, and whether or not you're putting forward your match, which they were, are going to follow throughout uh, the, the project. Um, I see a question from Scott. There's really no risk of uh, canceling the Reconnecting Communities program. Um, they theoretically could at any point come back and repeal it. Unlikely to happen. I haven't really seen that happen outside of reauthorizations. But in terms of a particular project, if you don't obligate your dollars by September 30th, 2025, your money evaporates. It's gone. Um, that's been pretty standard for programs like RAISE. They really want to see that money being spent. Um, and so having a schedule for those capital projects that show you'll get to obligation by that time is important. Sometimes Congress will look at money uh, in the formula program that's just been sitting out there for a long, 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 long time, and they'll just sweep it up and put it back into the program. You can't do that when money is obligated. They can't come after that money. So it just basically locks it in for you. Um, and according to Congress, they're going to want that lock-in to happen by September 30th, 2025. Um, in terms of match, the match requirement is 20% for planning grants and 50% for capital grants. Um, that you can use state funding as long as that funding does not come from the federal government. I say this particularly for those that might be working with uh, uh, communities in the South. The South tends to have a bunch of their state and even local programs and sometimes staff funded with federal dollars. That cannot be a match uh, past 80%. Uh, you, know, you, you must have at least 20% of your dollars coming from a source other than the federal government, even if it's a pass-through. Uh, so the match can be state funds, they can be local funds, they can be philanthropic, they can be private funds, they can, I've seen, you know, they can be raffle funds. It's fine, as long as it's not federal dollars. So if you are thinking, well, could I take money from uh, this business or this charity or this civic organization? My question is, is that organization are taking money from the federal government? And is the money they're giving you originally from the federal government? If the answer is no to those two questions, yes, it can be a match. This includes in-kind. You can have in-kind match. For example, maybe uh, you've got someone who says, I will do the design work on your project for free. You know, maybe you've got a, a partner in your community who works at an engineering firm and they're going to donate their time. That can count as a match. Um, but once you're relying too heavily on in-kind dollars, you're going to have trouble because, again, this is a reimbursement program. And you can only get money back when you're paying for the project and you're showing your match as you go. So you, 
if you're trying to get really close to 20% with in-kind, you're going to get yourself into trouble. You're going to have to be liquid. You're going to have to be able to put some money down to pay for the planning or the capital to get moving. Um, and again, federal dollars can be used uh, on uh, either one of these so long as up to 20%. If you need 20% to be non-federal, whether it's planning or capital. On the capital side, they're going to want 50, no more than 50% to come from this program. But you could go as high as 80% from if you're adding other federal project or programs to it. So maybe 50% comes from the Reconnecting Communities Program, and then 30% of it comes from the National Highway Performance Program from your state. And that adds up to 80%, and then you have a 20% match. Um, so eligibilities, uh, planning grants, very broad, public engagement, feasibility studies for pretty much anything you're going to be looking at preliminary engineering, environmental work and permitting. You can do land use and zoning reform planning. You can look at housing. You can st start taking steps uh, to, to manage gentrification, to address neighborhood changes, make sure that you're reducing impacts on the people uh, that we're trying to help. Um, so planning grants are very, very broad. Capital grants, um, I think the, the big thing to know is you can, you can go straight for a capital grant and still do some uh, uh, minor planning and feasibility, uh, sorry, some uh, engineering and design work. Your planning and feasibility needs to be completed, but if you need to do, uh, you know, your preliminary engineering and, and final design and things like that, you can be doing that in planning grants or capital grants. Uh, this funding is for replacement, removal, retrofit, or mitigation of an eligible uh, facility. Uh, and they specifically want the mitigation of impacts to be eligible. And throughout the notice, they, they talk about making sure that mitigation is part of your work. Um, planning grant applicants can be states, tribes, local government, MPO, or a nonprofit organization. Capital grant applicants must be the owner of the facility. It makes no sense for a project to be built, uh, uh, you know, using an asset that you have no control over. That would be like saying that we will give you money for a roof hook replacement and you can replace any roof in your neighborhood. You can trespass on that roof and replace, you know, on that property and, and replace that roof. Some people might consider that to be kind, others probably would not. Um, so the lead capital applicant must be the owner of the facility. So if it's a rail bed, you need that, that uh, uh, probably class one or short line owner. And if it's a highway, you need it to be the owner of the highway, which is usually going to be the state. They do encourage joint applications with others, but um, the lead is going to have to be that owner. I want to be very, very clear on the deadline. They do not play on this deadline. When that time is hit, full stop, they don't care if it comes in 30 seconds late, they will not accept it. I, when I was there, we rejected applications that were two seconds late. The deadline is the deadline is the deadline. Uh, and to get ready for that deadline, you need to be registered on SAM.gov where you apply and receive a unique identifier number. If your community has a DUNS number, which is the number you got uh, registered to, uh, for any federal uh, funding support, that needs to be changed to a unique identifier number. You need to get on that today. Uh, they are backed up on this conversion. And if, uh, if, if your unique identifier number is late, you can't apply for this, no exceptions. So do not wait, do not walk run and, and start work on this immediately. You also need to be set up with an account in grants.gov, which can be quite clunky. My advice to you is uh, do not wait till the due date. Try to go in and file at least a day early. Uh, I don't know what the demand for this program is going to be, but the RAISE program has crashed this site before. And if the site crashes and you miss the deadline, tough. So don't chance it. Um, 
you're pushing your luck if you're if you're going up against that deadline. Um, okay. Uh, criteria. I'm not going to go through all of these. You all can read it, but I want to just uh, talk about what I see in each of these that I think is important to look out for. One is they are quite serious when they divide things between primary and secondary criteria. If you do not score well in primary criteria, they don't even look at the secondary criteria. That's something they only get to. Sometimes they only do an analysis on once they have forwarded things from the primary criteria. So there will be a group of career staffers that will do a review. They'll give a rating of these four areas. They will then forward projects that are highly recommended. Those highly recommended projects uh, will then get an analysis of the secondary criteria. So really focus here. This is the substance of what they're looking at. So in equity, environmental justice, community engagement, they want to see your analysis of harmful historic or current policies, existing disparities, uh, and uh, ba basically they want to see how you have defined the problem, where you got your information that defined the problem, and how the solution you are proposing is designed to meet those problems. They want to see specifically that you, uh, particularly for planning applications, that you have a, per, a community participation plan. If you are going straight to capital, they want to see that you have engaged uh, the community. Uh, and they want to see what you did to engage people that are hard to engage. No excuses. People speak different languages. They work multiple jobs. They're hard to engage. That's what the plan is for. That's what they want to know. And they want to know how you are planning to mitigate any potential displacement uh, and just the basic construction impacts. That's for capital only. Across these criteria, planning applications are judged on their approach to these things and construction applications are judged on how they are fully addressing it. They're presuming that all of this has been analyzed in the planning process and that you've got an answer to all of these things. Um, in terms of mobility and community connectivity, uh, they want to see that there is a project that is creating significant barriers to access, that your project will remove those barriers and reconnect uh, the communities. And they specifically call out, including reducing over-reliance on automobiles. So they want to see the reconnection of the communities going beyond cars. And they would particularly like to know that you know, right now, maybe you have to drive or go a long way out of your way to cross uh, an asset, but in, um, in the reconnection, maybe you're creating shorter trips and making walking trips possible. Even if you theoretically can walk a long distance, people aren't gonna do that. So the reconnection should be beyond just vehicle connections. They wanna see that you are improving access to daily destinations, uh, they want to see new or improved affordable and safe accommodations for all users. So they're looking for new connections, maybe transit connections, maybe um, uh, biped connections. And they particularly call out uh, doing it in a way that integrates with the surrounding community and context. Uh, they're uh, looking at uh, for projects that are particularly for facilities that might be anticipated for replacement in the next 20 year cycle. Um, and for construction jobs, they wanna see that you've analyzed impacts to goods movement. Um, and then in terms of uh, stewardship management and partners, they want to know that uh, you are elevating a community centered approach to inequities and you are your project will benefit the harmed communities that are the ones whose, uh, you know, the impact is, has been felt uh, over past years. They want to see formal partnerships with those in the area, whether uh, they are, um, uh, you know, people living there or, or, you know, business owners, things like that. Not a theoretical partnership. They want to see MOUs and, and something formal that shows that you all are truly tied together. Um, they want to see a representative community advisory group to oversee the development of priorities and then make sure that those make it into eventual projects. 
And for capital projects, they wanna see the committed funding. This should not be theoretical, the funding should be there. And then the last criteria, criterion is equitable development, shared prosperity. So they want a comprehensive plan of the community's approach to increase mobility. Uh, they want uh, to see a plan for community restoration, stabilization, and anti-displacement strategies. They want to see that what you're doing is going to be done thoughtfully of the community, its uh, culture and history. So creative placemaking that uses art and, and, and culture to weave things together is going to be looked very positively on. Uh, they want to see inclusive economic development and entrepreneurship. So are you working with those local businesses? And for um, uh, capital grants, they want to see that you're going to have good paying jobs. Um, you're going to uh, have opportunity for workers to unionize and workforce development opportunities as well. I will say in the notice, they have a lot of tools, some uh, at the EPA office on environmental justice that they cite um, to help you quantify and, and, and do this analysis. I strongly support looking to utilize those. Um, I also wanna point out that we have worked with folks to use just uh, a, a lot of the technology you have in your smartphones to uh, measure access to destinations. Um, there are platforms now that will allow you to evaluate uh, the extent to which people can reach all kinds of destinations from homes. It can calculate potentially hundreds of thousands of trips in just a couple of hours um, by all modes of travel. If folks are interested in that, I'm happy to connect you with, with people who can show you how to do that. It might be a good effort to include in your uh, planning if you're looking just to do planning. And you can go into the same map that's calculating all these trips and you can put in potential changes either to uh, a highway, uh, regular roadway, maybe bridging, like we're talking about bridging them, adding transit, adding bike ped connections and see the scores change very quickly. Um, secondary criteria only matters if you scored well in primary criteria, they're gonna look for project readiness. That means your technical readiness. Uh, so that's uh, the, the primary sponsor's ability to deliver the project that they promised. Uh, they, that could include looking at past efforts with uh, federal funds and just generally the technical expertise being dedicated to the project. There's financial. They want to know that you have a full financial package to complete the project. So again, um, uh, well, I, I'll put it this way. The feds want to be the last money in. So they want to know that if they give you money, what you promised is what you're going to produce. For capital projects, they're gonna particularly look at a cost estimate and whether or not you're putting forward a cost estimate that appears re uh, reasonable and recent because uh, they've been burnt on this before where people have come in in the past uh, and asked for, let's say $10 million to do a project that as soon as they put it out is actually a $20 million project according to all the bids. So if a, you know, uh, a projection is five years old, especially considering inflation, they're not going to consider that to be a complete financial package. Um, environmental assessment, have you complied with uh, uh, permitting and environmental reviews? And the benefit cost analysis, which applies to capital projects only. Uh, there's a bunch of instructions online. I'm happy to go over it with you all um, in more detail if you have questions. But let me just say, this is not something I'd spend a ton of time stressing about. There are people that can help. Uh, there is uh, instructions online about how to do quantitative benefits. They do want you to uh, cover even things that are hard to quantify. And there are circumstances under which they will fund projects that come out with a negative rating. Um, if it's clear, if it's a community that might have a, a low population, uh, if it's clear there are a lot of hard to quantify benefits. The way scoring works, like I said, there's a group of uh, career staff that will read all the applications. So let's say they get um, 500 applications. 
they will have teams that will be in charge of reading, let's say 50 uh, of them, and they will review them together and then they will elevate um, their highly recommended projects and maybe some recommended projects if they're noticing that there's a state or a region that doesn't have a lot of highly recommended projects and they have to have geographic diversity, they'll dig into some of the recommendeds. To have a highly recommended project under those primary criteria, those four primary criteria, you're going to need to have at least two high ratings. And they do high, medium, low, and non-responsive. So you need two high and no non-responsive. For a recommended, you need at least one high, no more than one low, and no non-responsive areas. Um, if you get highly recommended or recommended, they're going to go look at your secondary criteria scoring, which is a whole other team that looks at your technical and financial uh, environmental uh, assessment and your benefit cost analysis. And then all of that goes up to a senior team that's made up of all of the um, assistant secretaries in the office of, uh, of the secretary, the deputy and undersecretary will be there. And then the modal administrators will be there um, along with the head of, of some offices like the Office of Civil Rights and things like that. They will make some final decisions, well, they'll make some decisions and create a potential list. And then they'll bring that to the secretary who will question them and there will be some back and forth. Often uh, the senior team will give a, a list of projects that goes beyond the funding available and they work with the secretary to pare it down. But then the secretary might also say, I noted that there's no projects on this list from this place. If you have a project, I wanna see it and there will be some back and forth there. Um, other things that matter. These are things that it's hard to write in a notice, but they matter, 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 matter. One, the scope, schedule, and budget. Your scope is what you're doing. Uh, your schedule and the cost. If I could mandate that every application start the same way I would, they should all start the you know sponsor of X along with their partners request X amount of dollars from this program matched by Y amount of dollars to do in one sentence, this project. That should be the beginning of every single application. When you are reading 50 to 100 grant applications that are 25 or more pages long, and you cannot find the basics, who the sponsor is, what they're exactly they're trying to do and how much they're seeking and how much they're matching, it drives you insane. And it makes you not like the applicant. And I have seen scores be lower than they should because it's hard to figure out what they're asking for. I will find applications where people go into how important it is. This project will be transformative. It will create jobs. It will create economic development. It will make it possible for people to access the things they need. And you're reading it and you're like, I don't, what is it? Don't do that to your reviewer. Spoon feed them the information right up top. Um, write for people who have never been in your community and have no idea what your project is because you don't know which team of career reviewers your uh, application is going to go into. You're going to want to have everything you know, tightly explained for those that might know your project because I can tell you um, we were very hard in the Obama administration on projects we were familiar with. Um, there's a belief a lot of times by the ethics attorneys that if you know the project, you'll go too easy on it. I found it was the exact opposite. Um, but you should assume that at least one of your reviewers, probably all three, don't know your community. So after you've drafted something, it's always good for someone who doesn't know your community or your project to read it and let you know they understood what you were seeking. Um, pictures and maps, you can't have enough of them. Uh, it really helps people understand. Uh, you can explain the problem or you can show it to them. Um, if you can partner with a photographer in the area, maybe get some nice aerial photographs, that can be very helpful as well. Um, provide evidence that something is actually going to happen. So especially for planning grants, the number one fear, particularly on Capitol Hill, which 
those are the funders of the of the program is that we're going to have a bunch of plans and nothing's going to be done so you want with a capital project you've got to make a pretty good case that you're going to build what you say you're going to build but the question that every reviewer is going to ask when they're reviewing your application um, on uh, a planning grant is am i funding a plan that's going to go nowhere they're going to want to have a sense that you're really building some momentum with their fund and last then this is only helpful if you've really done well on everything else. A good tiebreaker is for DOT to know that their funders like your project. Their funders are Congress. Now, I can tell you I was asked to talk to many a senator and a congressman to explain why we would never fund their favorite project because we didn't think it was good. And let me tell you, that is an unpleasant conversation to have. But when you have too many good projects, which is likely to happen here, and one has a lot of support from your congressional congressional delegation, and one does not. USDOT would be crazy not to choose the one that comes with a lot of support, not just because it's their funders, but because those are the people that are going to help you bail out of a problem. So if uh, if you start running into political woes or funding woes, um, I also just wanted to let you all know that uh, we have some resources online about the overall infrastructure law. If you're looking for which uh, other programs you might want to look uh, to for, for help in funding this um, and, and just getting a sense of what is in there and what the rules are, we're going to continue to add to this. And we're also going to be working on creating an overall advocates portal that just answers a lot of questions about the transportation program how projects are developed and how decisions are made. Uh, we'll also be putting together some polling and some communication strategies. Um, but this is there for now with an overall portal coming in uh, probably four or five months. Um, so I see a bunch of questions here in the chat and I do just wanna let folks know uh, that I'm happy for Ben to share the presentation and I'm happy for you to follow up. Any with any questions you have even after today. Um, I did see a, a question in here. Uh, can I talk about planning and capital grants for ongoing projects? Uh, you're so citing Portland. Uh, your project is a five to eight year transformation of an orphan highway. Uh, there are projects happening. So I, the big, you can absolutely come in for additional funding. What they want to know for capital is that the project they fund is of quote, independent utility. So I remember, uh, this won't apply directly, but I remember when we were doing uh, the RAISE program, we would explain to DOTs, we're not gonna give you money to, um, to go in and grade a, a whole area for a roadway and then have you come back to then pave it. You got to have something that people can use for transportation by the end of the use of our grant. So we'd rather you do a whole project that connects, uh, that creates a highway between two connecting points, than grade an entire corridor and the need to come back and pave it later. So think about what are those projects of independent utility along that orphan highway, and that. Uh, should work great here. In fact, you can rely on your overall corridor uh, study and planning efforts to explain how it fits into the vision. And, uh, and you can use uh, future funding for the corridors match. Just keep in mind anything spent in the past is not the official match, uh, the 50% for capital uh, projects. Nonetheless, even if it doesn't meet the match requirement, showing that money has been spent to realize this vision is still really great for competitiveness. So I would definitely talk about that. Um, I, I would love to talk to you about what additional planning you are seeking. Um, so maybe we can talk offline a little bit. Uh, there might be, for example, a project you're looking to build and then you wanna do additional planning going forward for another segment. Um, you can put in different applications. Every project lead can put in up to three applications. Um, then a question about NEPA and CEQA. Ah, the, the, the forever question about NEPA and CEQA. Will these projects uh, that receive these grants but no other federal funding be required to conduct a NEPA study? Absolutely. 
Um, I know that California uh, uh, has its own rules and there are some rules in place that can help you mush them together to the extent that that is possible. Many times some of the alternatives analysis you've done under CEQA can stand in for NEPA, but you are going to have to do NEPA if there's a determination that um, uh, a high level of analysis is required. So keep in mind, doing NEPA is actually used as code for many, many different things. One is complying with the National Environmental Policy Act. That could mean that you just have to do what's called uh, a categorical exclusion, which is a very low level of review. It could be an environmental assessment, which is a, a slightly deeper, but that we're normally talking about very extensive studies and environmental impact statement. And uh, those are not required for any but the biggest, most ambitious projects. Um, I will also say a lot of times people think permitting and NEPA are the same thing. They are not. So if you have an endangered species issue, that's ne not NEPA. That's a totally separate process. Uh, if you've got a wetlands issue, it can be can it can be joined with NEPA, but that's not NEPA. So, um, but this is all stuff you can work on with your your state DOT or your uh, federal highway administration uh, division office, which is located in your capital uh, uh, city in your state, uh, and they can answer a lot of questions. And in fact, engaging those offices can be very helpful to answer these questions. I recommend to states that they do the same before they put forward applications. Um, okay, so Jay says we have a group of Texas nonprofits talking about building a collaborative proposal and funding across sta the state and different uh, organizations. Do you think working across communities uh, is good. Well, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, USDOT would be very excited to see collaboration across efforts, but they probably would want you to apply with uh, separate scopes for each of the communities and then just talk about the application in there, how you're going to work across the communities. That's going to come in very well in the partnerships criterion. Um, and it's uh, uh, you may be able to bring your overall costs down uh, by working in multiple places. You can have some if-then phrases in here. So if USDOT uh, decides to fund two or three different planning grants in our state, we will be able to work together to reduce costs. But uh, they're going to want to see each effort. And they're very intent on understanding the localized engagement and uh, analysis and uh, uh, communities that will benefit that I think they'll each need to be uh, separately written out, even if you're talking about um, uh, working across them. You can have the same lead uh, for multiple communities, but just keep in mind every lead can only put in three applications total. How far along does an idea have to be to apply? It's a great, great question. Um, I would argue that it probably doesn't have to be that far along if you have a very strong network of partners. So, you know, keep in mind which was the primary criteria and which was the secondary criteria. So just to, to go back and look at it again, um, it, it's, it can be quite instructive just to go back to this repeatedly. Um, the primary criteria is looking at these these overall attempts to, to make, you know, what, what is the overall outcomes? You're looking to engage the community. You're looking to make sure that you're creating greater equity and shared prosperity. You want to make sure that you're taking care of, uh, uh, you know, addressing historic wrongs, uh, and you're going to end up connecting people to the things they need. Um, it's not until you get to the secondary criteria uh, that you're looking at, at some of the other things. Um, so from that perspective, uh, and looking at, at your, your question, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have the technical feasibility or the financial stuff all wrapped up, um, for, for the overall thing. You're looking to bring people together and explore. If, however, you're starting at the beginning and you have a very narrow group of partners, that's going to feel like there's not much you can get done that's gonna feel a little too ex exploratory. So I'd say with a narrower group of partners, you want the partners to be the right partners and you wanna have a firmer idea of what you're doing. Um, if, if, for example, you have the city and the state 
uh, and the MPO engaged and you all want to start out together, it can be a little bit looser. Um, and then when the grants are being handed out, are they usually given to places in states where the lo local and state officials have support for it? If they don't, what do they do in that situation? Uh, there's a big, it depends here. Um, it, you're going to need support from somebody. Um, so, for example, in raised grants, I remember giving a grant to Whitefish, Montana, even though the state of Montana didn't like the project. Um, if both didn't like the project, it'd be real hard to justify giving, giving money. Um, if you're looking to build support and maybe your city just hasn't made a statement in favor, um, but maybe you have a a city councilman who's really excited about it. And even though you don't have the mayor, you've got some people in public office that really want to explore this. That might be enough. But again, it's hard to fund a planning grant if it's clear from the beginning that no one's ever going to take that plan and do anything with it. And I think uh, DOT will accept a portfolio approach so they might have an approach that shows that, you know, a couple of their planning projects are real, real iffy, but they're going to want to have a, at least as many, if not twice as many that are, look really, really good to balance those off. Um, so just keep in mind, it will depend on how many uh, come in in those iffier positions. That's going to look like much lower feasibility. And also in terms of doing modeling in the area, you're going to want to know what your regional transportation authorities, whether it's the MPO or the city or the state, think. Because if not, then you produce this plan, you hand it to them, and they say, but your numbers are garbage. You didn't use my inputs. So you really want to have some level of at least coordination with them, if not uh, outright support. What other questions do folks have? Feel free to come off mute and share and, you know, complain, <laughs> whatever you have. Beth, just real quickly, you're following up on your answer to my question. How important is it that the DOT, the state DOT likes what you want to do? I mean, for a planning for, grant- For a plan. <laughs> For a planning grant, let, if, if the city loves it and the state's not quite there, you're fine. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it, it's a, a slam dunk. You're going to have to have a lot of other things in order. But there's a good argument to be made that you've got to show them why it's not as bad as they think. Now, if they are totally outright opposed, forget it, no way. Sorry, guys, my, my son is in the background here making lots of noise. Um, if uh, I, it's going to be hard to get some information, and that could be a problem. The, the higher capacity your city is, the better off uh, you are. Uh, but just keep in mind, um, there, there are just degrees here. So maybe the state is really suspicious of this, but they're not angrily opposed. That's going to be a little bit easier. Maybe they're they're generally they think they're opposed, but they'll still give you information because they think that their information is going to show you it's a terrible idea. That's going to help. Um, and and the stronger opposition you're going to have from your state DOT, who is likely going to be the person, the organization that has to do the final project because the owner of the asset will have to come in for that. Uh, the stronger your support from other entities has to be. So in that case, uh, project sponsor being a public entity of some sort actually helps with the gravitas of it should you decide to move beyond the initial planning to other pieces of it. Absolutely. What, you know, you can think about ways to start to build support around your DOT. Maybe you've got legislators who are going to come to your rescue and they're going to be engaged in this process. You've got some strong mayors that are going to build a coalition and really push hard. Um, you know, the, thinking about that, you've got some big institutions, maybe a state university that's also, you want to have that as a counterbalance because what DOT is going to want to see is, oh, this is a well-formed coalition of people that are willing to push the DOT really hard. 
Thank you. Beth, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, based on your comments about uh, setting out the project scope uh, mm -hmm. you know, right at the outset, mm -hmm. um, is there any place or where people can find successful previous applications for USDOT discretionary grants? So your own community probably has applied and won in the past. And, and you can ask them for that grant application. The, the applicant itself must make it public. So DOT can't release it. But I mean, honestly, I could I could sit here and off the top of my head write that opening sentence or or the little box in the corner on that first page that tells you the name of the project, a sentence description of it, the overall cost, the uh, the match, and the uh, project sponsor. So the city of Washington, I uh, DC, is seeking fifty million dollars to redesign K Street um, as a complete street. This is not for this program. This is heading much more towards the, the neighborhood access program. But DC is seeking $50 million to redesign uh, K Street as a complete street to reconnect the communities on either side and will be providing a uh, $25 million grant. At, at least I know generally what you're talking about, right? Um, so yeah, that that scope being, you know, we we want to build a land bridge over Interstate 10 between point A and B for this amount of money with this amount of match. And and repeat it. I often tell people to write it like a like a newspaper article. That line is your headline. Uh then, you know, they have a paragraph where they kind of restate it with slightly more detail. Then they restate it again, <laughs> with, you know, uh, over the next three paragraphs, and then they go into excruciating detail. So, um, yeah, just like a, a, a one sentence intro. Sometimes it might take two sentences to explain your project. And then a, a one page backgrounder on exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, the, the problem statement, the solution, and why it addresses the problem, and then go into the format and say, you know, that this is, this is in response to the format you have suggested. Um, in the notice, they specifically lay out the form, the, what they would like to see in an ideal application format. Don't improvise, don't get creative. They told you what format they wanted in. Give them, give them what they asked for. Just like when we apply for jobs and they say, I want someone who is a detail-oriented self-starter. If you don't somehow say that you're a detail-oriented self-starter, you didn't read the, <laughs> their, their uh, pos position description. Give them back what they asked for. So um, in fact, I'd really love to, uh, to see them do these application processes more like a lot of philanthropy does where they say, you know, state what your project is in one sentence. How much are you seeking? What is your match? Who is the lead? Who are your partners? You just fill all that in. And then, you know, you say, uh, you know, you have, you know, whatever it is, 500 words to respond to criterion one. And then, then from a reviewer's perspective, everything you would need is right there where you want and you can find it. But instead they, they welcome uh, creativity, which usually leads to confusion. Don't be too creative. Be very straightforward. Be very, uh, basic, uh, like very clear and lots of pictures and lots of maps. No, uh, DC is absolutely punished. Uh, D DC never, never sees a penny because uh, they get beat. Uh, they have no representation in Congress and uh, everyone on Capitol Hill hates their guts and most of the nation does. So DC gets passed over for most everything. Um, yeah. Any, any final questions before we wrap it up? I think that this has been uh, fabulous, really informative. If in developing it, you have further questions, you should absolutely feel free to just email me. Uh, just reach out uh, and feel free to ask me something. If you're... Uh, uh, 
If you're working with a bunch of partners, which is good, sometimes getting everyone on the same page can be hard. I'm happy to join for a half hour or hour call uh, to ex explain some of these things with that group. Sometimes that can really help put together uh, the approach to the grant application. Yeah, great. Well, I think if there are no other questions, uh, let's all give Beth a round of applause and thank her for coming in and uh, uh, really enlightening, I think, in a lot of ways, the details behind the process, demystifying it is a good That's, way to put it. That is my goal, to demystify this process. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, and be on the lookout. Uh, well, I do have recorded this so we can go back and re revisit it. I'll send it out um, and be on the lookout for uh, our next bit of freeway fighting uh, meeting and programming that's coming up. Enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.